Hi everybody, welcome to what is a very, very special day for Mindaroo, for the University of Western Australia and for marine science, not only in Western Australia but all around the world. Uh, my name's Tony Warby, I lead the Flourishing Oceans Initiative at Mindaroo Foundation and the Planet Portfolio, which encompasses all of our environmental research. I'll be your MC today and step you through a series of really exciting presentations from key people that have been involved in getting us to the point where we are today. Believe it or not, today marks the anniversary of the first publication of Darwin's Origin of the Species. 24th of November, who can guess which year? Excellent. <laughs> I think you may have had something to do with the notes, Steve, so, um, but, you know, well done. Uh, and that was something that really changed the way we think about and observe and understand the natural world. And I think what we're embarking on here today, somewhat more technologically advanced, but will deliver a very, very similar kind of revolution in the way we observe the ocean. Uh, the promise of environmental DNA to really revolutionise our understanding of the ocean, to help us really look at and understand and manage what's in a marine park or an exclusive economic zone or towards the hadal depths of the ocean, incredibly important. And so I think this will be a moment in time that we look back on and really feel like we're at the start of something quite incredible in terms of marine science and ocean observing. I would like to welcome three distinguished guests. There are many more distinguished guests in the audience, forgive me for not naming everybody, um, but the US Consul General, Suryana Nair, great to have you here. Um, the Chairman of Mindaroo Foundation, Andrew Forrest, and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Western Australia, Amit Chakra. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on here today, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, uh, and of course to acknowledge the, the continuing connection they have to the land and the waters in this part of the world, and of course all around Australia. And shortly, uh, Robin Collard will conduct a welcome to country for us um, to, um, uh, to ensure that um, uh, you all feel welcome on, uh, on this country. I know at all of these events, someone stands up and gives you the emergency procedures. Um, today you actually have to listen because you're not only surrounded by amazing scientific talent but this building is full to the brim of dangerous chemicals, okay? <laughs> so if you hear an alarm, you don't panic but you do react to the first alarm. You don't sit and wait for a second alarm or a third alarm. Um, I do need you to go out of the um, uh, the main doors here, if there is an alarm, orderly fashion please, of course, uh, but we do need, um, we do need to move if, <laughs> if in case there is an alarm uh, and there's wardens that will show you to where the muster point is around on the green grass. Um, uh, facilities both to the left and to the right of, of this lecture theatre. Um, so with that, Robin, I'd love you to come down please and provide us with a welcome to Wajak Nungabuja. Thank you. I bring my message stick of peace. When Noongar people travel across country, we take our message stick and it always has a different and unique story to it. So for me, it's about the footprints and walking across the land, the wako, my totem koya, the frog, my late husband's totem, Jiraklani, the turtle, and my beautiful late daughter's um, depicting of the dragonfly because she would paint them. So that is my message stick. I'm truly honoured to welcome you this evening to this fantastic launch of the Oceanomics Centre a home for the science. Nunukan 
Nonokan Maman Munis, oh Ngan Kurt Jurupin. My heart is so happy to see all of you as leaders in Nunga. We're very lucky because we can say Buriyas and it means all of you, and particularly our leaders here in the front. Because the knowledge that you have and the space that you bring your learning to is just absolutely amazing. I feel so in insignificant as a teacher with my couple of degrees that, um, so thank you to actually be here. And I also say that this is a very special place, a home for your knowledge. And I will share some words to do with this centre with you this evening. Jibble jobbling, wolbering. So we need to have a healthy and healing place to swim, whether that is on the beaches or whether it's under the sea. It needs to be safe and healthy. Ngabalongunda is the Noongar word for safe. Nunukinjena bidi nidya wadarin. So as you are walking across this land, but also swimming, and whether it's in the oceans, it needs to be a safe place. Nidya kulunga kura kura. We need to think about our children and the future, because they are our future. And after doing a welcome to country for schools on waste and recycling, etc., I thought, you know what? This is actually about teaching the children. It's about starting at the top. It's about lobbying. It's about challenging. Because this is our future for our children. And I think of my 14 grandchildren, I want them to have a safe future, along with their cultural knowledge, but also this place. So it's very important. Nijabuja, the land, Wadran, the sea. Nunukan Kambarang, Bulabadip Nija, Nunukan Murich. So this is about being strong, solid, resilient. And you know what? We can make change. We are resilient. We've shown that through COVID. So let's show that resilience through making this planet healthy. Because for Noongar people particularly, there are three things that are very important to us. Our connection to land and the sea. Our connection to family and our knowledge. If that's important to us, that's important to you too. So thank you for the opportunity to be here, but also for these wonderful stories that we're going to hear this evening um, and through the leadership. Murich, Yunka, thank you. Family, environment and knowledge, I think it's clear evidence that our Indigenous colleagues took a systems approach to things long before we were ever taking a systems approach to things. So Robin, thank you. Thank you so much for those words. Some of the Indigenous words that you mentioned are wabring, which is healthy. Uh, nubala nunda, which is safe. Wadaran, oceans. And kura, the future. So healthy, safe oceans going forward into the future, I think, were the key messages that were coming from Robin. At Mindaroo, we like to challenge impossible, as you saw uh, in the short video. We're ambitious and we're impatient in our approach to solving some of the most intractable challenges, both facing the ocean but also humanity. And this is really embodied, embodied excuse me, in Mindaroo's 10 values. We like to take risks. We're prepared to fail as we go, as long as we learn lessons along the way and figure out a better way the second time. Um, but we also like to take the approach of being humble about what we're doing as well. And that humility means that we must partner. We have to partner with the best and brightest uh, in the university sector, across industry, across the NGO space, uh, across government, wherever it may be. Um, and UWA is absolutely a partner of choice. Uh, we have a number of major programs with the university now, the Forest Scholars Program, the Deep Sea Research Program, a lot of uh, marine scientists from the university taking advantage of the facilities up in Exmouth that we're so proud of. Uh, and so it's, it's a wonderful partnership across so many levels, and I think this Oceanomics Centre will really deepen and strengthen that partnership, and I think we're off to a great start with it. 
The Vice-Chancellor has not only been a great supporter of Mindaroo, but a great supporter of this facility from the get-go. Um, I know from Steve that um, a couple of years ago there was a walk around the campus to figure out where we would be having this event today, where the labs would be. Um, and, uh, and so really from, from the very get-go, the commitment from the university to establish this centre has been there. I'd like just to acknowledge as well Tim Colmer. Uh, you've been a, a huge supporter all the way along as well, Tim, from the university, and we're incredibly grateful for that. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Amit Chakma to come up and make some remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Kaya Wangju, good afternoon. Well, this is an exciting day for the university and for all of us. So thank you for, for being here with us today. Council General, great to have you. Uh, it's your uh, early days in Perth, but uh, you're off to a good start to get to know, you know the wonderful things we do at this university and beyond. I would also like to thank my colleagues at the School of Molecular Science for hosting us. A very uh, you know, fitting, uh, uh, if you will, uh, venue for the Department of Science that uh, we are undertaking through oceanomics. So, uh, you know, the School of Molecular Science, just think of the name. Uh, it's all about fundamentals, trying to understand the fundamentals. And oceanomics, as you'll learn later, is trying to do exactly that, but for a greater cause, so using fundamentals. Uh, to enhance our understanding so that we can do things better. Well, we are very proud to be a major research-intensive university, but we have high aspirations for ourselves. We are determined to be a leader in global oceans research and education, and we could not achieve our goals without the generous support, more importantly, the vision of Mindru. So, the two coming together creates enormous opportunities for all of us to you know, aspire to greater heights and make significant contributions to our planet, of course, in this case, oceans. So on behalf of the university, I express my deep gratitude to Mindru, to Andrew Forrest, uh, whom we are proud to call one of our own, and notwithstanding the accolades uh, now, Tony was sharing about the quality of work that we do, which is true, but there is another special bond between Mindru and us, and that's really Dr. Andrew Forrest, because he's a proud graduate of this university. Uh, you know, a, a very seasoned businessman typically would not have much biases, but you can't really ignore that soft touch with your alma mater. So we are proud to have Andrew as one of our graduates. The Oceanomic Center will address one of the most challenging tasks before us, the crisis of endangered species threatened with extinction. It will use modern knowledge, the so-called eDNA, to accurately monitor life in the global ocean. We are not talking about just our ocean, we are talking about global ocean, contributing valuable evidence to support and protect conservation. I'm also hoping that it will eliminate the need for future graduate students to have to count fish or other species from videotapes, reportedly as had been the experience with Dr. Andrew Forrest, one of our distinguished graduates. And Andrew was telling me that uh, the time and effort he put in uh, to generate the work in support of his thesis with the modern facility, I thought that we could produce 10 PhDs. He said, Thousands. <laughs> so, so you can see the progress that uh, we are able to make with this wonderful laboratory that we're just about to open. We are proud and delighted to be able to host Minder's Joint Genomes Laboratory and Computational Biology Services on our campus right here in the School of Molecular Sciences. And to be a part of Minder's ambitious and revolutionary ocean conservation program. This is a special day, this is a great day, and this is an exciting day for all of us. Thank you very much to all of you for making, you know, bringing this to fruition, for making it happen. Thank you.
Thank you, Amit. Um, as, uh, as the Vice-Chancellor has just said, Andrew Forrest uh, is no stranger to the university, having completed his PhD here. It was titled Pelagic Ecology and Solutions for a Troubled Ocean. And later, uh, he published a peer-reviewed paper in Conservation Letters called The Panthalassa Project, The Future of Ocean Research for Conservation. And I think that really laid out a lot of the vision for this, for this centre and, and challenged a lot of people to, to step into this space. Andrew, you're a passionate advocate for the oceans. Uh, we love to embrace and harness uh, that passion. We're grateful for it and I'd love you to come forward please and, and make some introductory remarks and, uh, and launch the centre. Thank you. Professor Chakma, Consul General, thank you so much, all of you, for coming. This is, uh, it m memorialises a really fabulous, fabulous event. Uh, this, is, this is not the dream unfolding, but it is certainly this. It is the beginning of the dream. And, uh, and there's no way we can protect what we can't measure. And I nearly wept explaining to my professor, no matter how hard we worked, no matter what we did, counting dead fish on the back of trawlers, or even counting them on a screen and identifying them and using the best technology which the university had to actually measure fish, even though they could be eight metres away or two metres away, you could measure them from, from snout to fork, then you could probably work out how old they were. And that was it. That was it. And just towards the end of my PhD, four years, I'm not that bright, um, it, we were just starting to use AI to identify fish instead of students like me, slave labour. Um, and because uh, everyone knows professors, you get to do your three units exactly what they want you to do. And if they're silly enough, you'll publish another couple on what you might want to do. But the one which I was most passionate about and was warned if I took it on, I'd add another four years to the PhD. Um, I didn't blink. I thought, we'll just get the PhD done and, and then we'll hammer this afterwards. And it's this. It's a total game changer. It was... I can't express... When you know the ecosystem which supports 99% of the livable space of the world, you know, which we know less about than the surface of the moon, is being destroyed. Global warming is deoxygenating the oceans. Plastic is killing countless animals. Just as I speak, overfishing just puts a terminal end to species. You cannot remove a species from an entire ecosystem and expect the link in the chain to still hold the chain when you've removed a link. The ecosystem is in danger of collapse. So we needed something completely new. And Larry Marshall from CSIRO, he was already pushing ahead with eDNA mapping of the terrestrial environment, but on the marine environment was new, and to do anything like what we're doing now was utterly, utterly groundbreaking. And without this, unless we can quickly see what's in the ocean before it's destroyed, if we can measure it so we can protect it, then we have no hope of protecting the ocean. As I counted fish, dead fish on the back of trawlers or on the screen, I knew that the rate of terminal decline of our oceans would overwhelm anything all the combined researchers of the world could do because you just simply couldn't get enough data. It was, it was <laughs> hard fought. Every little bit you got, you had to scratch and kick for. And so with eDNA being able to take all of water column samples where you can actually determine what's not only there but has been there in the last few days. It just opened up the data from a little trickle to this massive waterfall of data. And Professor Chakma, thousands of PhDs was a chronic understatement. We cannot 
costly compute, even with today's computers, with a Pawsey supercomputer, the amount of data which we're able to get through rapid sequencing of D DNA, now whole genomes, the information is just massive. The challenge to convert all that data we've now finally got coming at us in floods, turn that data to information is also enormous. So we established oceanomics and then we immediately realised we didn't have the DNA library. It didn't exist in the world. There's 5,000 odd museums around the world who all had samples, but amazingly, not sequenced. And this is the pool which Dr. Steve Bunnell is now reaching into while his scientists and, and PhD applicants are reaching into the much greater pool as we speak of the Indian Ocean and taking DNA samples in the tenth voyage of the Pangaea Ocean Explorer right up to the coast of Keeling Islands, which I hope, Dr. Bunnell, you'll, you'll speak of more. So Steve will talk to you about creating the library and it's the first time it's ever been created in the world. We have sequencing of about 1% of the vertebrates of animals with backbones in the sea, and that's it. The rest is just a blank, dark canvas. So I wanted to share with you that the journey may have started at the PhD, and we've got a little trial vessel, 60 metres, but a heavy duty research ship is doing fantastic work. It's got very similar machines and horsepower as we've got in our laboratories, actually on board for the first time ever. And we're running sequences at four billion nucleotides, I think, every few hours, I mean, which make up the DNA. I mean, that is just massive and unheard of re until only recently. That's rolling through the positive computer to, to the computers here and we're now starting to understand a little bit of what's in the ocean. But the Panthalassa vision is a fast vessel which can do water samples up to 100 kilometres a day of representative ecology, the whole water column, surface and atmospheric conditions really determining what's in Australia's economic zone before we destroy it, yet with one proviso with governments, and I got really hammered on this during my Viva, the, the, the two-hour um, interview you have with professors of whom you just feel so lucky to even meet, let alone be examined by. And they said, when I was explaining oceanomics and the potential future and that we were going to go ahead with it, and I had already purchased a ship and we were converting it to a full research ship, they said, well, now we're really worried. I mean. They didn't kid that they might fail you over it, but, they, but you could see in their eyes that they were worried. And they said, if you do shine such a spotlight into the ocean and if you are overtaken by a flood of data, which only now artificial intelligence has the wherewithal to decipher for you, the human brain can never do it. From, from what we've learned about whole cell analysis, that, that magic soup, that kind of analog magic soup around around the DNA, you know, that you've got the digital, you've got the analog, and to interpret all that data is so massive. And that magic soup, we're not even looking at hard yet, yet we know that geneticists around the world, and particularly in China, are looking right at that, even for things as basic as rice growing, where you might have rice which needs to be planted each time and now they're looking at species which can last 10 years, four yields of rice per year and it's only 10 years because that's all I can count so far. Absolutely revolutionising their understanding of just the magic soup of rice. Imagine what we can do with fish and understanding how they live, their abundance, their health. All of these things we couldn't normally do, we can now do just by capturing cells. And millions and millions of cells, and only AI will help us with that, only AI will drive that the human brain just hasn't the hope. So I wanted to say thank you, Steve, for coming on this journey with me. Thank you for driving it so hard. Tony, thank you for empowering us and encouraging us all the way through. 
Professor Chakma, these beautiful facilities, um, our scientific partners, um, help me with the name. Illumina. Illumina, thank you. <laughs> Cut your tongue out, Forrest. Um, but Illumina, thank you so much for partnering with us in several, several areas of ocean science. And may we now struggle with this huge volume of data and meet the concerns of my professors in the Viva where they were saying, well, what if you do shine this torch through the ocean? What if you can determine for the first time ever what is actually in the ocean? What if you discover species which could be predated by the most massive predator in the world, which is humans? What if you discover species which are of high commercial value? What would you do? I mean, you're basically handing the keys to a robber. And I said, no, it's simple. We will be doing immense research in conservation areas and governments who wish to have us determine what's in the exclusive economic zone and hear the word economic, uh, they, they will need to pass legislation to protect all the species which are above near threatened in the IUCN red zone, vulnerable, endangered, extinct in the wilderness, extinct. You know, those species must be automatically protected as we discover perhaps very large populations which maybe the yellowfin tuna industry didn't e know existed or we discover vulnerable species which are great table fish but could be rendered extinct if, if they're not protected. Legislation must protect them first. So the fishing industry has to have the struggle which we do now. If we if we want to protect an endangered species, a vulnerable species, we have to go through two years of arguing in Parliament and lobbying and this and that. Well, it'll be just automatically protected and the fishing industry can go through the two years of arguing and lobbying. And that way, we will not only illuminate the ocean, we will not only measure the ocean, we will protect the oceans. Thank you. And now it's my great honour um, to uh, grab Professor Chakma and let's, uh, let's unveil the plaque, sir. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. Um, it's time to introduce Steve Burnell. I think, as uh, Andrew's just alluded to, Steve has, uh, has been on this journey for a number of years and has really been responsible over those few years for taking the vision that you've just heard about from Andrew and getting us to the point now today where we've got a great team uh, in Mindaroo, I think 12 staff in Mindaroo now, 10 staff at the university, those numbers are growing, so we're really set up for success. Uh, many of you may not know, Steve wears a few hats in the foundation, uh, and I think he was originally being interviewed somewhere in the Middle East by Andrew for a healthcare role, which he did come and do, but as I understand it, they found you know, a joint passion and love of marine ecology and spent the vast majority of the time talking about that. So um, Steve kind of came over to lead the cancer initiative uh, and has been um, a key ally and a leader in this space in the ocean. So, Steve, please come up and, um, and fill in all the gaps and, and tell us what the centre's going to deliver for us. Thank you. The ocean is critical to all life on Earth. It covers more than 70% of the planet, it stores 20 times more carbon than land, plants and soil combined, and 3 billion people depend on it for food. Yet below the surface, Climate change has caused the water to become warmer and more depleted of oxygen. Half of fish stocks are overfished and a tenth are on the brink of collapse. Add plastic pollution and this perfect storm is accelerating a rate of biodiversity loss that's projected to result in the extinction of more than a million species over the next 80 years. Thankfully, more governments are moving to protect ecosystems and threatened species. 
but Measuring Changes currently relies on very local observations or reported catch data from fishing boats. What if a bucket of seawater could be analysed at speed and tell us most of what we need to know about life in the surrounding ocean? We are working with partners to develop breakthrough techniques enabling population scale monitoring and protection of marine wildlife. Using microscopic environmental DNA or eDNA collected from seawater, hundreds of samples can be analysed at once to capture data on a myriad of species. Innovations like autonomous samplers and high throughput sequences can massively increase the scale of monitoring without harming marine wildlife. Putting this into action, sequences in our shipboard lab have enabled our scientists to sequence at speed and scale while at sea. Only 1% of marine vertebrates have had their genomes sequenced to date. By creating a DNA database of these reference genomes, similar to police forensic databases, we're able to more accurately identify marine wildlife using eDNA. And we're not stopping there. By applying artificial intelligence to interpret this vast eDNA data, we will speed up the process even further. By providing more meaningful data in near real time, increasing awareness of the true extent of biodiversity, we can revolutionise the way we measure, understand and conserve life in our planet's only ocean. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tony. Uh, and thank you, Andrew and Amit. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and a privilege on behalf of a, a team that has done an awful lot of hard work over the last two years, uh, really investing in, in this vision. I think the whole team um, buys into this vision and is incredibly passionate about it. Uh, so our mission is to revolutionise how we measure, understand and ultimately conserve life in the ocean. It's a pretty big vision. You don't do that sort of vision alone. Um, and we're thrilled to have partners here today. Thank you for coming. That little animation explains something about the challenge we have, which is how to communicate a, a pretty a set of technologies and science that can get a bit confusing for a lot of people. And uh, we have a lot of opportunity to try and, and share that message and share what eDNA is and what a reference genome is and stuff. And I know we're sitting in a university and you all get it, uh, but, but not everyone does. And, and uh, that's why we created that video. And it's actually proved to be quite powerful in simplifying the message. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, the threats facing this, the only ocean that surrounds this planet. And if you tip something in, in the Indian Ocean, it, it gets everywhere else. So we think about it as one ocean. The first uh, fact there is fascinating. We don't know whether there's 500,000 marine species or 10 million. Um, and those are the ranges that scientists give as to how many species uh, there are in the ocean. 80% of it unexplored, 90% yet to be classified. Um, Three billion people rely on the ocean for their primary source of protein. Um, and it absorbs, right today, 25% of all of our emissions. And as you saw in the animation, it stores um, 20 times the carbon of all of terrestrial land plants combined. It's under pretty great threat. We've talked about it a bit today. Um, here's a couple of facts, and I won't go back over them. Um, other than to say 90% of wild caught fish species um, are predicted to have collapsed by 2050 if we keep taking them uh, the way we're doing today. Um, there are four programs in the initiative of Flourishing Oceans. Oceanomics is only one of them and we're thrilled to be working with ocean conservation, sustainable fisheries and research and infrastructure. Um, but you can see some of the main focus here is 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the world's oceans conserved uh, by 2030. And how do we really create sustainable fisheries? It's not about stopping fisheries, it's about making fisheries sustainable. Um, that's why I knew the date, Tony. <laughs> uh, it is an auspicious day. It's, a, it's an incredible, um, I think it's just fantastic that this revolution in marine genomics and what marine genomics might do for biodiversity and discovery is, is we're launching it here in our own way um, on the exact day that uh, Origin of Species was published first. Another pretty interesting fact that emerged in November uh, is that we think of uh, all of our hominin relatives as being meat eaters on the plains and actually some, a paper that just published in Nature this month showed the first uh, 
780,000 years ago was the, is now the first evidence of our hominin ancestors um, eating fish and surviving on fish from the ocean. So humans have been depending on this only ocean for a very long time. Um, Andrew described the panther lassa vision. Um, it's true, I went for a healthcare interview and, and we talked a lot about the ocean um, and, and I, bought into, I bought into the vision. It, it's a, it was an incredible sort of view of what could be and we are only in the very first chapter of, of this story um, but it's fantastic to have the privilege to be able to work on something and have the vision uh, and, and this sort of mountaintop we call them in, in Mindaroo, this destination to head for. So oceanomics is really about using marine genomics as this, this technical sort of ba basis for how do we do non-invasive biodiversity and population health monitoring. Um, if we can do that at the speed and scale that we intend to, it, it will absolutely revol revolutionise how we do it. We're focused on eDNA because it's such a powerful dispersed technology, but as you saw, genomics more generally, particularly computational biology of genomes and also the reference, the reference libraries, they're a critical part of, of this. And without those, the eDNA is just floating fragments in the ocean. Um, another part about scale and something we're really starting to ho focus up on is autonomous vehicles. And, and how do we not go out even to collect the seawater in the DNA? And how do we actually scale that? So there's a lot of technologies now, um, drones and sail drones, that can do all sorts of ocean sampling. And uh, we're working to customise those so that they collect eDNA. And then as Andrew Forrest mentioned, Dr. Forrest, appropriately, um, that we are, we decided on, that we embarked on this journey and then realised that we didn't have the dictionary. And if you want to really understand eDNA and use it to its full power, you really have to build those dictionaries. And those are the reference genome libraries that we're now investing in and this centre is capable of producing. So, it is non-invasive, it's hugely scalable, and the one thing about eDNA is it democratises life. Whether you're a whale or the smallest plankton, you are releasing DNA into the ocean. In one litre of seawater, there are a billion bacteria and 10 billion viruses. I hope that doesn't stop you going s swimming. <laughs> none of them, or mo almost none of them, are destined for humans. In fact, the viruses are mostly after the bacteria. But it, it's an incredible sort of diversity of life. 90% of the biomass in the ocean um, is bacteria, or microbial, I should say. Um, and so when you're working with eDNA, you really are picking up everything. You, you get this snapshot of all plants, all microbial, prokaryotic life, eukaryotic life. Thankfully, we've got partners in this huge challenge and one of the things we're focused on, there are programs that have focused, the microbial component is hugely important and there's a whole program that's been going for a long time called Tara Oceans that is focused on the microbial components of the ocean. We're really looking at marine vertebrates and, and you heard Andrew mention it a couple of times. So this is how do we harness eDNA to understand marine vertebrates, everything with a backbone. So this is 21,000 species of marine fish um, and about 500 other species which are mammals, reptiles, and seabirds. And all of those are in scope for us in our initial focus, so certainly when we're building the reference genome libraries, we're focused on, on those, and obviously we're doing some pretty important work in this innovation space with a number of partners, some of which I'll talk about now. Trying to get this at the right level uh, is not always easy. So there are three main sort of workflows that we use in the eDNA analysis. Metabarcoding, when we're looking for specific target genes. Shotgun metagenomics is actually where we sequence absolutely everything we collect from the sample. And single cell genomics, which is uh, Andrew Forrest's particular um, interest and something that if we can crack it, will be incredibly game changing. Um, and just, I'll start from single cell genomics first. So whole cells exist in the marine environment after they're shed from an animal. So mostly eDNA is fragments of DNA, tiny fragments. Um, but occasionally you get whole cells. And if you can collect those whole cells, the great thing about an intact whole cell is that it has a whole genome inside it. That whole genome represents an individual. And uh, if we can do, bring the analysis that we do with single cell genomics 
from human health and medicine and apply it to marine conservation in the ocean on these intact whole cells, it will be an absolute game changer. So we're investing in that with our partners Bigelow and UCSD um, in the US who are single cell marine sequencing experts um, and AI experts. Shotgun, and, and these topics here, I won't go through them all, but every one of them, if, if you're on this team or probably others in the audience will know that these represent huge challenges and we've listed them here under each of these because microbial depletion, how do we deal with an eDNA sample that 99.8% of the DNA in the sample is microbial of origin when in fact we want to look at marine vertebrates and understand the, the fish. So obviously there are challenges there and we're working through those challenges. One of them is how do we deplete the microbial component and enrich the vertebrate component. Um, there are others, so multiple genetic mar markers in metabarcoding. The longer you can get these fragments and the more markers you can look for, the more reliable is your data. So th these are really a set of challenges. Each one represents something that we can set individuals and a team on in an attempt to crack them one by one, but we're not shying away. So the thing about what we've been doing today is we've been using a ship, a shipboard lab, and we've been advancing the feasibility and taking high throughput, throughput sequencing to sea. What this centre upstairs that we're opening and today really does is provide a sort of scale to our research and development that is just uh, almost impossible today at sea. It allows us to test and develop all of these technologies. So we have cell sorting, single cell automation, we have robots that you can do things that would take an army of technicians to do. So after you've collected the eDNA from the ocean, filtered it, extracted the DNA and sequenced it, this is where the magic really starts and probably where a lot of the solutions will emerge. And that's computational biology and artificial intelligence. So this is a massive data stream, as Andrew alluded to. Once we start really getting the number of samples that we're talking about getting from the ocean, it will just be a huge volume of sequence data that needs to be interpreted. And this is where uh, the computational biology teams and the deployment of their technologies really come into their own. We're thrilled to have Illumina. UC San Diego have the best people in the world for developing algorithms to try and identify individuals out of fragments of DNA. Now that, if, if solved, will really game change marine conservation because all of a sudden eDNA, if you can assign it to individuals, you'll be able to talk things about population health, abundance, a whole new level of information. And uh, I think we've got the right people on the job. So essentially, you can collect eDNA through Niskan bottles, through autonomous samplers, shipboard lab sequences it. We have these two workflows, metagenomics and amplicon sequencing, which I described before. Um, one looks for fragments of a target gene, so you can look for target species, you, can look for hu you could look for all bony fish, or you could look for yellowfin tuna. And then I talked to already about metagenomic sequencing, which is really where we, we sequence the whole array of DNA in the ocean, particularly useful and powerful for creating taxonomic diversity indexes. So if you're looking at biodiversity, and, and this is actually the Pawsey supercomputer in real life, um, down in this bottom picture here. But the, the, the uh, graph on the bottom right is actually uh, from the Rolly Shoals. It's the Monte Bellows and the, and the three atolls of the Rolly Shoals. And it's showing taxonomic diversity across a, a group. So we've, we've done three trips to the Rolly Shoals now and have data from over three different years. And it's showing some of the diversity that exists in the fauna, the fish fauna, across just these atolls that are only about 20 miles apart. The other thing that uh, computational biology can do, if you move into the realm of uh, AI, is where it becomes unsupervised, is it can interpret your data and learn from it without being taught, essentially. And this is just an example of a plot and a, and a new classifier uh, that's been written by the team, um, and, and Philip in the team, who has created something that is essentially already pulling apart families of fish, as you can see here. The colours represent individual families, but the algorithm trained itself 
and pulled these apart. I think um, in 0.9 seconds on Pawsey, it went through 20,000 um, samples of e uh, um, sequences, samples, and teased apart these families of fish, and it's, it's clustering them quite well. The fascinating thing here is, without wanting to geek out on data too much, <laughs> is that you've, you've got these groups, and there's an orange group down the bottom that represents a particular family of fish. And it may be that um, those are all of the same species, or it may be that they actually represent individual species, and this gets to Andrew's point. As we get the dictionary better, and we fill out the reference genomes, the opportunity here of finding new species that don't match the reference genomes um, becomes greater and greater. So there's some pretty powerful approaches and techniques that are emerging, and they're, they're kind of here, um, and they're, they're ready to be deployed. Um, we talked about building the reference database and, and the collaboration with UWA. We now have this incredible facility. You don't need to be at sea to build the dictionary. So the fantastic thing about this centre is that it has incredible scale, and thanks to Illumina with their really next generation instruments, but also PacBio and the Nan Oxford Nanopore who are providing long read sequencing capabilities, we can build the reference genome databases that we need to really advance this research. And the important thing is, like everything Mindaroo does, that data is openly shared and, and published for science. So those reference data are critical for scientists all around the world. Um, we have pretty incredible capacity. The only point I'll really make here is that the instrument that we've taken to see very successfully and that Andrew was talking about with uh, 2.4 billion reads um, is, is the, uh, the smaller high throughput short read sequencing box. The, the one upstairs is more than an order of magnitude uh, more capacity. And it, it does 48 whole human genomes in 48 hours, um, probably about 190 or 100 fish genomes. Um, and so it's really going to allow us to take a crack at the 20,000 marine fish that need their genome sequence. Um, in, the, in the library, if you like, the dictionary, um, we're really looking at it because uh, we have to prioritise, as everyone does. So there are 400 families of marine fish. And so for a start, we're going to get a single species from every family and do a, high fi a, a very high quality reference genome for that and publish it. Um, we're working with CSIRO, who are here today, um, and the National Biodiversity Library, Mindaroo has partnered to support um, reference genomes, draft genomes, they're called mitogenomes, um, for 5,500 of Australia's marine vertebrates. Um, and those are coming out of the National Fish Collection and through partnerships with uh, CSIRO and, and um, museums. So that's a phenomenal effort and should, should be able to happen quite quickly because in most cases the samples exist. And then um, for Mindaroo, aligned with our Flourishing Oceans initi initiative and our priorities, really how do we use uh, and prioritise species to build genomes, all the threatened uh, and high conservation species, a lot of the commercial fish species haven't been sequenced and no one knows their genome. So if you want to monitor them globally in the ocean, th this is what we have to do. Uh, these are some of the things we've done to date. Ten expeditions, 2,000 samples. We've been looking at marine heat waves off, the, off this coast, um, up around the Abrolhos and tropicalisation, some fishing pressure and obviously some MPA work in the southwest to support um, DBCA and others uh, looking at um, marine protected areas. Uh, it's all about partnerships and probably the most exciting thing and something that pretty much everyone told us wouldn't work was taking a high throughput sequencer to sea on the vessel and having it actually work beautifully. Um, and so now we have the full, uh, the full workflow from sample collection, extraction in a wet lab, sequencing, high throughput sequencing at sea and even bioinformatics to a server on the ship, uh, a very capable server. So we can do it all in near real time. Uh, those expeditions have, to date, for us, been mostly around Australia and, and as you see, a real focus now emerging on the Indian Ocean, uh, quite deliberately. Um, it's the least explored of the, of the large oceans. Uh, the, the GIF, I'm told, not a GIF, for those who think it's a GIF, it's a GIF, the guy who invented it says it's a GIF. Um, the, the GIF. The GIF shows where the boat is at this very moment. And so that's the track of the research vessel Pangaea. The blue dot is Cocos Keeling group of islands. 
the blue circle is the Australian exclusive economic zone around Cocos Keeling, and you can see another one to its right, which is Christmas Island's exclusive economic zone. One of the reasons we're going out there is it's Australia's most recent uh, marine protected area, Christmas and Cocos Island. Phenomenal, um, relatively underexplored, under-researched, hugely biodiverse hotspot globally, let alone for the Indian Ocean. Um, and it's an opportunity to really do some advanced eDNA survey work around there. This is our container lab, sequencing lab on the vessel. Hi everyone, we're out here in the eastern Indian Ocean, approximately 700 nautical miles from the Cocos Bulu Keeling Islands, on our 10th oceanomics expedition. We are very sorry that we're missing the launch, but we are very excited to apply our conservation tools to how we measure, understand, and going to protect life in this very unique remote islands. We look forward to being reunited with the rest of the team in a couple days time. Came in this morning, a uh, little bit of a surprise from the vessel as they, as they steam um, northwest. Uh, but obviously thrilled to have the team. The rest of the team who've been supporting the opening here will actually be flying over and joining the ship, which is spending 21 days through the marine park and importantly up into that piece that's not in the exclusive economic zone between Christmas and Cocos Island because it, that piece is so heavily fished um, by international fishing fleets uh, that we hope to find um, some interesting data uh, differences between the economic zones and, and those areas that are really intensely fished by open water fleets using eDNA. Uh, this is just, I, I've talked a little bit about it, it's the three Rolly Shoals atolls um, up in the northwest here, well known to West Australians at least. Um, and some of our first data from up there showed that um, the, the, I won't go into it, but essentially that's a, that's a genomic tree of the bony fish and it shows uh, a whole lot of species that were known from that area and quite a few actually, um, represented by some of the orange dots there, quite a few that were new to the area. Um, one of the things that really is exciting is already in the early data sets, the importance of, of collecting data over time. And that most scientists know that time series data are important, but for things like conservation and, and really understanding global warming, time series data is gonna be key. How do we tease apart whether these are just minor changes or these are due to a, a warming around those particular um, island groups? And interestingly, these three colored groups here are three separate trips to the same place. 19 February 21 and August 21. And you can see this, this change in um, uh, temporal variation in the fish families that were there. Um, there's a correlation with water temperature, but we really need to keep going back to know whether that's seasonality or whether that's some sort of longer term change. But these are all things that eDNA provides the power to uh, assess. I talked a little bit about um, ocean-based sort of autonomous sampling uh, obviously the ship at sea is one, but there are a couple of others. So how do we really take these technologies to sea, in some cases convert them to collect environmental DNA that when they were built for something else? Uh, so we've been doing that. Uh, we've built our, uh, a sampler in the middle here, which is a, a fixed device. It's the Ocean DX fixed device. It's deployable, it's got seven channels, it pumps water, um, and essentially you can leave it in place and come back and collect your eDNA filters. So for somewhere like Ningaloo Reef, you can put a series of these along um, and check them. But there are much more large and open range ones like the blue bottle here, which is powered by solar um, and the tides essentially uh, and the currents. And it's got a broad sensor sweep. It's quite a, a I think it's four meters long. Um, and it can do 30 uh, or more filters, samples and, and store them and preserve them. Uh, and essentially bring them home. So these are things you can set out on transex on a, on a totally different scale, totally autonomously, um, and get sort of long-term or temporal eDNA samples. And then on a much smaller scale, the, the advanced, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the company, but anyway, Hydrus, advanced navigation, thank you, Tony. The, Hi the Hydrus um, is a partner of Mindaroo as well. It's a fantastic little drone, effectively, underwater. It's got a camera on it but the ability to actually do passive eDNA sampling uh, on that drone and be able to actually use it to go. We, we literally count fish on scuba surveys today uh, for some of this stuff. And you can imagine cryptic species or small species or whatever else. It's very hard to do that. 
um, and an eDNA survey on a small device like that uh, becomes incredibly powerful. And then finally, there's a lot, if you've been reading the news in Australia, um, about uh, how do we value nature recently um, and biodiversity credits. It's exciting to see, actually. Um, and obviously, even when ministers are starting to talk about the need for scientifically robust methodology in these sort of things, we know about carbon credit trading schemes. But as we move into a, a world and a future that ultimately looks to start valuing nature, um, we're going to need ways to measure that. And uh, one of the best ways in the ocean, and probably from my point of view, the only way uh, we'll really be able to measure biodiversity in the ocean and be able to use it for things like um, the sorts of uh, nature finance tools uh, that are emerging that are going to be critically important to driving conservation will be environmental DNA. So it has, it has a lot of opportunity, genomics and eDNA, to drive this sort of next step of financial metrics in nature, particularly with the ocean, I think. Um, I want to thank the team. This is the team, very happy in, in their new centre upstairs. You do have an opportunity to tour the centre um, if you haven't signed up. I know it's late, but if you have a, ch a chance, it's well worth a tour. The team's standing by to take people through if they're interested. Uh, phenomenal team. It's a great privilege to work with them. All experts. People, people have come literally from around the world uh, to join this team. Uh, it's not a, a vast pool. Um, people have been working in molecular genomics and AI on these kind of things. So uh, we're very fortunate to have them. Um, and then I just a couple of acknowledgements because this, this has been an incredible partnership. Uh, there's a lot of people who have helped on, on multiple things and, and uh, some I've thanked directly. I, d I do want to again thank Tim um, Palmer and the Vice-Chancellor Amit. Thank you so much that your team as well. Christoph's here today, I think. I'm not sure if Martha's here, but it's been fantastic. Uh, Anna, thank you for coming and thank you for your support. Uh, the build team that built this centre upstairs uh, over the last 18 months, it's been a true partnership between Mindaroo, um, Kate Stevenson's here, but I know there are others. Trevor uh, deserves our thanks. They did a fantastic job. We have an advisory board, so the next five people you may not know, but for us, they're incredibly important. Uh, they're global experts in this field and in AI, and we convene them quarterly uh, to keep us on the right track and give us advice. And then obviously um, Andrew and Nicola uh, for their support, but most importantly for their sort of uh, their vision um, and their confidence in the team, uh, and, and their allowing us to chase this chase this vision. We've got incredible partners. I've me I've mentioned them I think as I went through, so I won't I won't belabor it again. Uh, but at that point, I'm hoping because I'm going to invite the leaders from the team up to join me that we might get a few questions from the audience with respect to the program. Thank you. Anyone have a question? Yes, Jock. Um, uh, is this coming through clear? Okay. Uh, Steve, you mentioned um, uh, that as you gather momentum uh, in terms of your technology prowess, you may be able to conquer um, some of the issues with eDNA. One I'm particularly interested in is abundance. Do you believe that your that's in the foreseeable future to be able to say in the last 48 hours I believe the abundance of this species is X you want to take it? Julie yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely that's been done before so there are a few studies now even with threatened species that are more rare um, there are a few studies kind of showing that if you um, collect them and do traditional counts or catch per unit effort you see a very good correlation with uh, eDNA concentrations. It doesn't work on a sample-by-sample -sample 
level. So your likelihood of seeing that organism in, uh, in that same exact space and time as you collected that DNA isn't necessarily like accurate, but over um, large space spatial scales, so um, so across you know a bay and a coastal region, um, with within the Long Island Sound, it's been demonstrated as well. Um, you you do see a very good correlation between their eDNA concentrations and um, their abundances. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Can I just add one thing, which is that we we are kicking off a super exciting thing in Shark Bay, <laughs> where because looking for contemporary measures that use visual or other ways of, of looking at the wildlife. And Shark Bay is a tr fantastic environment for doing that. And get cat getting eDNA contemporaneously and comparing it to visual aerial surveys of la like turtles or tiger sharks. These are all ways that we can actually start to address exactly those type of questions. Which are the, which are the right ones? Amit. Um, do you have a timeline with respect to your ambition? When do you think you'll be able to crack the nut, as you put it, in the five years? <laughs> There's a whole bag of nuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, who wants to take a crack at that? Shannon. Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon will talk to her particular challenge or... Paul Gamblin, Australian Marine Conservation Society. Um, congratulations, it's a very exciting arena. A bit related to Jock's question, I think. To what extent have you had the experience of, of meshing oceanographic dynamics with eDNA, particularly for spatial management, marine protected areas, and that, that kind of thing? What potential is there for that? Thanks. Hmm. I think it's Julie again. <laughs> so, um, one exciting avenue is um, to designate key biodiversity areas. So in reality, as you uh, move across the spatial scale, you'll, you'll see these hot spots where there's um, either threatened species or there could be um, a concentration of, of species that are very unique um, across that area. So it has a lot of potential in that area and identifying um, those regions that aren't yet known um, because of the spatial scale that you can kind of push out the technology. Um, but it, in addition, uh, we've got s some expeditions going along the southwest and across MPAs and non-MPAs. And um, our ambition there is to kind of uh, see what that baseline is, but also to measure over time and see if those protected areas are actually um, having an effect and if they're um, spilling over into the, the adjacent regions. So. So one of the one of the most exciting things about eDNA and, and Mar Australian marine parks uh, are actually obviously very interested in supporting our trip to the Cocos Islands is, is that th there isn't baseline for so much of these parks that are being declared. So un understanding the biodiversity that's there, even if you can't describe it to a species level, but you can describe it through sort of these tax or independent indices that show the complex biodiversity, it still allows you to monitor over time and see whether there are changes. So it's a very powerful baseline to start doing today. Any other? Yes. Yeah, hi, it's um, Brett Polony from CSIRO. I'm still getting my head around, you know, somewhere between you know, up to 10 million marine species um, and just the data streams coming through. Like, are you able to share some insights into AI and ML in that approach and what do you think the next breakthrough in that space will be? Aha, uh -huh. I'm just the guy for that. <laughs> Seth. Yeah. That's you, Seb. <laughs> In case you're wondering. Well, it's me and Philip <laughs> working <laughs> on this. But um, the challenge with everything is really the reference genomes. Even though you might you have these unsupervised machine learning and AI tools, but in order to train them to identify taxa, you need the references. So that's the biggest hurdle. There's already algorithms out there that you can utilize. And Philip has successfully done this for um, as a test bed, as um, Steve has shown in the, in the slides but we're really lacking the references. That's why it's so important to have this um, lab here and creating these reference genomes because you can't put a name to it if you don't know what the DNA looks like, right? 
But in terms of the data volumes, um, AI is really good at working with really big data streams. And since we have the Palsy Supercomputing Center here and we also have in-house servers where we can do AI um, algorithms and training, um, we're well equipped for this going forward. Any other questions in the room? Oh, Tony, Tony Bliss. Steve, sorry, just uh, more of a nuts and bolts question, kind of related, but um, now in terms of understanding where the tech is on site, in terms of process, the, the massive volume of microbial content versus vertebrate, mm. um, and what, what, is, what does it look like now in terms of your ability to process a volume of seawater and, and, and detect what is vertebrate DNA and what is uh, microbial, for example? In, in a time sense, you know, based on where the tech is at the moment. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll start, but Priscilla, why don't you start and I'll finish. <laughs> so one of the most common techniques that's been used for a few years now, it's called eDNA metabarcoding. So that's able to focus on a particular group of interest. So in our case, it's marine vertebrates, specifically fish, by targeting a particular gene that is specific for that group you are working with. So by targeting that gene, you're able to ignore the rest of the DNA that is part of your sample, which is the majority of the mi microbial origin. So this is a technique that works, but has some limitations. So it's still a suboptimal technique in many ways. So we're trying not only to work with partners to advance that technique, but also to be able to explore other methods that make you able to focus and reach for your taxa of interest, in reach for vertebrates, or to deplete that microbial component. So there are a few techniques that we are exploring now. So by um, ways to degrade the microbial component of your eDNA sample, ways to target, to use different um, markers that can amplify your vertebrate signal to be able to overcome that, that inherent challenge that you have with marine samples. Um, in, in some respects, for eDNA proper, it's, it's, we're, getting, we're getting through it with these sort of targeted approaches. We're still working to get rid of microbes for shotgun sequencing. Single cell sequencing, if I admit we're still here, is probably the, the biggest nut uh, in the bag in terms of trying to crack it. And, and identifying individual floating whole cells from vertebrates, uh, from a milieu uh, of, of DNA and stuff in the ocean is, is a huge challenge. If we can do it, and we can sequence them, uh, we can enrich for them and sequence them, we get a whole new data stream that's around individual animals uh, rather than just presence absence uh, that you often get from eDNA. I think that, was that a lot, I think. Okay, so we received a question online, so I'm gonna read it out and then make an attempt at answering it. Uh, so to make good observations, you need good data. So my question is, is it possible to get high quality readings from environmental DNA alone? Can I hand you this back? <laughs> so uh, it's a really good question, and we, you happy for me to take it? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, it's something that we talk about a lot amongst our team. We just heard from Seb a few moments ago and from the presentation that obviously ec excellent quality reference material is a key part of us being able to make um, inferences from environmental D DNA um, data. So that's a really key part of what we're working on here. But also, we do recognize that um, we want environmental DNA to be one of the tools that's in the toolkit. Um, that's a, a way that we can survey biodiversity. The key benefit, I think, of environmental DNA and the part of the vision is that it is truly massively scalable. And so if we can address some of these challenges that we've been talking about, one is identifying individuals from that data. <laughs> Um, and also trying to see how we can look at more of these little fragments that are floating around in space, then um, yeah, we're gonna kind of improve the amount of information that we can get from environmental DNA. But there will always be a place for us to be able to um, sort of sense check what the inferences that we're making from environmental DNA from other traditional survey methods. Thank you. I think, I think we do have to shut it off there. I really appreciate everyone coming. It's wonderful to see you. I appreciate those who've tuned in online. We're super excited to have this uh, new center with the university. Um, and we're looking forward to advancing this whole field, which I hope 
you're as excited about as we are. So thank you for coming. <laughs>